This is CPSC 526, 626, lecture 11 on the domain name system, DNS. So the primary purpose of DNS is to translate host names or domains, things like ucalgary.ca, into IP addresses. The, For instance, the IP of ucalgary.ca, which is 136.159.96.125. Now you can tell that that latter is not very easy to remember, and it's certainly not meaningful to a human. But the reason IP addresses exist is because they provide crucial information about how to find the particular machine that represents ucalgary.ca. Host names like ucalgary.ca or cbc.ca, these are easy to remember, and they're useful for humans, which is a plus when you're a human. But they have no location information encoded within them, whereas an IP address is hierarchical. It reads from left to right being coarse-grained to fine-grained, the represented as four separate 8-bit numbers, at least for the IPv4, and the outermost number is the most coarse, and the innermost number is the most fine. Often, within the same building, there'll be many machines where only the last number changes. But the first number changes when you switch buildings or countries or continents or something like that. It's atypical that two machines on, for instance, different continents would have all of their IP numbers the same except for instance, the last one. Whereas host names, they're, they don't have this fixed length. They're not exactly 32 bits in length, but they can be arbitrarily long, subject to limitations encoded in letters in ASCII. They can use the full alphabet, but it's hard to simply tell your ISP, I want to go to this word, and the ISP will know exactly what that is. And thus we use DNS to translate from host names to IP addresses. Here's a map of the internet. It was the IPv4 census map produced in 2012. I can't give you a updated version of this, unfortunately, because it was actually produced by a botnet and the attacker gained access to these machines by simply trying four different username-password combinations on as many servers as possible. Admin, admin, admin blank, root, root, root blank, if I recall correctly. And as they gained more machines, as they gained access to these machines, they would upload the code and have it continue on in the search. And they simply searched every IP address through a brute force space. Now this map is annotated with the original owner of a particular range. And so the entire map of IP addresses is the figure, the, the outer square that you see. And each of the inner squares, the small ones, such as the top left, reserved, below it, owned by General Electric, two over, you can see it's owned by Xerox, HP, Ford, MIT. These were companies that were involved in the original internet, the creation of the internet. They were core to the development of the internet. And as a result, happened to be able to effectively own an entire IP block that they then have control over. Most companies, of course, aren't on this list because they didn't happen to be instrumental to the development of the early internet. And so most IP addresses are given out by registers of numbers. And there's a variety of them. There's the American Registry of Internet Numbers, ARIN, and you can see ARIN throughout. There's the Réseau IP European, RIPE, which is the European Authority. AFRANIC has one, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. LACNIC, and Asia-Pacific NIC as well. And these would be the 
organizations that are responsible for giving out IPs to companies. Now, they might just give out, for instance, the first two numbers fixed, but the company is then free to have this, the third and fourth part of the IP address at their own discretion. They can assign them all. Or maybe the first three digits are fixed and you just can have any IP in the last number. Or in the case of your ISP, your ISP just gives you one number. That's your IP address. And the IP address that you get from your ISP is in turn given to the ISP through one of these companies that are responsible for giving out internet numbers. And you can see as well, there's some that are reserved, multicast and reserved in the top right, 224.0.0.0/4, means that the last three numbers, 0.0.0, .0, those are all contained within this box. So this botnet found 420 million hosts that responded to a ping. So they just tried to ping it at least two times that they got an answer. They said there was something there. It was not a botnet that was meant to mount an attack, but rather it w while still being a botnet and, and having exploits in order to do this, the idea was to actually do this census, to actually understand how full the IPv6 space actually is. And this is from almost a decade ago. So I'm sure that some of the unused parts in the bottom right have been since fleshed out. And this is why IPv6, which will give us far more IP addresses than we know what to do with, so that every toaster can have its own IP address, will help with this problem of, of near-complete utilization in some of the spectrum. Another thing worth pointing out, again, the fact that you can do this attack at all illustrates that IP addresses were never meant to provide some sort of security. It's possible to simply try every single IP address as this botnet illustrates, that you can just simply try to connect to every single IP address and see what happens. Whereas if IP addresses were cryptographically large, 128 bits, 256 bits, that would no longer be possible. You would have to have some higher level information about where the IP addresses are likely to be found. So the domain name system, this thing that translates host names into domain names, divides the namespace into what it calls subtrees or zones. And when we look at a host name like www.cs.ucalgary.ca, each dot separates these subtrees. And these dots become more refined as you move right to left. So unlike IPs, which are read left to right, domain names are read right to left. The dot .ca represents Canada. That's at the rightmost part. That's the coarsest that you'll have. Out of their universities in Canada will also end in .ca, but they'll have a different middle component. And the .cs, this represents the computer science department. And other departments at the University of Calgary will have, as well, their own domain name, their own host name, and the CS will be different. It will be replaced with something else. But the .ucalgary.ca suffix remains the same. So as a, just a visceral example, bank.com and mail.bank.com, both of them are bank.com. So if you trust bank.com, mail.bank.com is probably the where you send emails and receive emails. www.bank.com is their website. ftp.bank.com is their FTP server. Whereas bank.com and bank.ru are far apart. They're not the, necessarily owned by the same organization. It's just that someone in another, in another country registered the domain bank using that country's suffix. So this subtree, if you imagine we we're, we're have a, a, a tree, we're doing a search, we start at the root of the tree, we call the root dot, 
and this is hardwired in. So when we are trying to resolve, the, as it's called, resolve a host name into an IP address, we start effectively knowing nothing other than it's a host name. We call that dot, that's the root of the tree, and the next is the TLD, that's the top level domain, and these are things like com, org, edu, ca, ru, ch, and then if you are looking at a .ca hostname, you go to the .ca leaf or, or, or child in your tree. And now, you under this, you have all of the Canadian hostnames. And so you go to the next level, you Calgary. And so you can imagine, while this tree doesn't necessarily exist as a single data structure stored somewhere, virtually, you can imagine this tree as simply a search tree, you're starting from the root and you keep following children down until you find the actual leaf, which would represent the full host name. And we just store the IP address alongside the host name once we found that leaf. And so the searching of a DNS resol resolution, turning a host name into an IP address, is effectively walking down this tree, except that this tree is not stored on one computer, it's stored as a distributed database. Different computers are responsible for each node of this tree. So there's computers responsible for the root, and they only know how to tell you about .com, .org, and .ca. But they know which computer to talk to for .ca. So you go to that computer, and it knows all about UCalgary and other host names in Canada, and so on down the tree. If you go to the command line, you type dig, you can give it any host name, it'll give you the information. This is basically printing out in a nice format what the DNS packet actually provides as information. So in this case, we have a question. We're asking what is the IP address for cpsc.ucalgary.ca. So this address is known as the A record. And our request to DNS is to say, give me the A record, the address record for www.cpsc.ucalgary.ca. And the answers, it replies back, here is the answers to your query. It's www.cpsc.ucalgary.ca. That has a canonical name or C name as cpsc.ucalgary.ca. And it has an IP address of 136.159.2.21. The canonical name is existing because sometimes you might have two host names that actually just point to the same machine. For instance, www.cpsc.ucalgary.ca and cpsc.ucalgary.ca, no www, both point to the same machine. So when we look up the www version, the variant of it, we get back as an answer. Actually, what you're really looking up is just cpsc.ucalgary.ca. And, so you don't have to ask me again, cpsc.ucalgary.ca's IP address is 136.159.2.21. So this is an example of a DNS query. Now, again, we talked about denial of service attacks. Note that the answer to this is larger than the size of the request. The request is, give me the IP address of cpsc.ucalgary.ca, or rather www. And the answer includes the question and includes the answers. It's larger, and this is why we can have leverage this to do a denial of service attack. There's also a notion of text records, TXT, and these records are also stored alongside. They can be retrieved through DNS, and often they'll be used to store extra information, arbitrary information. They're unstructured in the sense that you can just store data there subject to uh, the amount that can be stored. And if you look up arbitrary domains, you might find some interesting things just being stored there, extra information. Sometimes there's keys that are used to, for instance, let's encrypt, for example, when you want to prove ownership of a, of a domain, they tell you insert this 
particular key value pair in your text record. You can put it there and that's and then they go and retrieve it. That's exactly how they assert ownership, that you have ownership over a particular domain. So you can search any domain like this, just type dig dash t txt and the domain name and take a look at what text information happens to be available. There's a notion of a DNS zone, and this is the set of all the host names slash IP addresses, so like the set of all machines that are managed by one DNS server. So for example, it doesn't need to be the case, but it could be the case that there is one single machine that is responsible for ucalgary.ca and cs.ucalgary.ca and mail.ucalgary.ca, and they're all part of the ucalgary.ca zone. So there's one machine, for example, that is the DNS storage, the, deep, the part of the DNS database that is responsible for knowing everything there is to know about ucalgary.ca, and it's known as the ucalgary.ca zone. And it will know anything that comes before it, dot ucalgary.ca. It can also be further subdivided. ucalgary.ca might have one machine responsible for cs.ucalgary.ca and another one for another faculty. It doesn't have to be one single machine. As soon as we've passed uh, into two levels of this tree, this tree can descend arbitrarily long. The idea is that when we are resolving a host name, we start at the right, we read the host name backwards, and as we read each part, we're descending down a child of, a, of, this, of this virtual tree by visiting different machines, and each machine along the way tells us which machine we need to talk to next. And these machines that are responsible for knowing all the host names and IPs managed underneath it, are, is, uh, it would be the zone master for that part of the domain. Also core to DNS is the notion of a name server. A name server is the software that answers these DNS questions, like what is the IP address for www.ucalgary.ca? It's a name server that tells us the answer to that. And if you ask a name server, what is the IP address of ucalgary.ca? Well, if it's responsible for knowing that information, then it just answers directly. It gives you the answer. And in this case, it's known as authoritative. It's the authoritative name server for the zone. And if it's an authoritative name server, it can answer the question. It knows, it has its own little database of every single machine and their IP addresses that are within its zone. And it can answer these questions. If it's a recursive name server, what it does is it goes out on the internet and asks other people to get the answer. So for instance, when your computer wants to look up google.com, your computer isn't the one that's actually doing all of this DNS resolution. You just simply ask your ISP and they run a recursive name server that does all the work of actually looking up the answer for you and giving you just the final answer. Now, not all name servers are configured to be recursive. And as well, there might be access control. So for instance, your ISP runs a name server, but it's likely not going to serve as a name server for people who don't use them as their ISP. So when they see connections from direct lines from their ISP network, from people's houses connecting to them, They'll answer those questions, but if it's just coming from an arbitrary place on the internet, they just get ignored. Google runs a DNS server, so if you're ever in dire need of a DNS server for some reason, you can just use 4.4.4.4. And that one does not actually have restrictions on who can use it, but of course they're just logging every request and that's how they, that's why they offer this as a service. And typically DNS will use cached values when possible because DNS is this thing that's happening every single time 
you visit a website. Because when you click on a link, that link doesn't contain the IP address. It contains a host name. And so that link has images, and all those images are linked to by host names. So to do this lookup, this database lookup, this traversal of a tree, to find the IP address for a particular host name, it's not just once when you visit the website, but it's for all of the content that gets loaded, and every time you visit a different website, this is happening all the time. And it has to happen before you can even connect to it. Before you can instantiate a TCP connection to go out and connect to that IP address, you have to figure out, translate its host name into the IP address. So, as a result, caching is used where if somebody else just looked up google.com, your ISP just remembers what that value is. So it doesn't have to go and do this database lookup. It just gives you the answer it just looked up for somebody else. And so common software for DNS, bind, power DNS, DJB DNS. We're going to talk about DJB DNS. This is Daniel Bernstein's implementation of it because this actually resisted an attack because he leveraged randomness because he thought it was a good idea to just use random ports. And it turns out that, as we'll see later in this talk, that actually prevented a, a, a massive attack. There's a notion of the authoritative name server, which is the name server that knows the host name and IP addresses for all of the machines in its zone. For every zone, for every DNS zone, like ucalgary.ca or cs.ucalgary.ca, there is somebody that somewhere has effectively a file of host names and IP addresses. That's the thing that you're actually looking up. You can imagine that XYZ is 10.3.5.23, and so on. So there's a list of all of these. This is usually an administrative function done by a human. So there's a file that stores all of the DNS records within the zone. There's a computer that's considered the authoritative computer for that zone. And in most cases, there's one machine. It has the file. It's called the zone master the authoritative name server. If you happen to be particularly busy, there's a lot of DNS requests, you're liable for DOS attacks, for example, then you might have replicas of this name server. And then the same file, the same data, is then just replicated to additional slave name servers, which are then considered authoritative to the outside world. So from the view of the world, any replica will do. Any replica machine that replicates this database that has this information, they're all fungible. It doesn't matter which one you actually use. But to the person hosting the DNS, this can be crucial because if you receive a lot of requests, one machine may simply not have the network capacity to handle them all to answer all the questions that come in. And so then you just have more machines. This also means that if a machine crashes, it's no longer the case that no one can resolve DNS queries anymore, that you have some redundancy. The resolver, the DNS resolver, this is the client part of the DNS system. This is the part that asks the questions and gets the answers and then allows the user to do web browsing. So this could be a small library compiled to programs that need DNS, a service provided by the operating system, an API call, a libc call. And this resolver is lightweight. It relies on the server to do the work. The resolver just sends a packet out saying, I'd like to know the IP address for this host name. And then the DNS server is the one that actually goes out and issues, the recursive resolver goes out and issues all the requests. 
the main records that are stored in the DNS system, it's more than just hostname to IP. That's the primary function, and that's why the A record, the address record, gives you the IP address for a hostname. The NS record gives you the name server for the hostname. That is, who is responsible, who's, who, what, what's the entity that stores this database. MX is the mail exchanger. TXT is, a, as we mentioned, for arbitrary text, but this can also be used by computers to implement additional functionality that doesn't need to be well-established protocols as part of the DNS, but just can be used to do different interesting things. For instance, Let's Encrypt, doing domain validation for certificates. This is done with text records without having to have that as a formal part of the DNS protocol. We just have these additional records that can be used. C name, as we mentioned, is the canonical name. And SOA is for start of authorities. And this is information about the zoned administrator who's responsible for managing the DNS system for a particular zone. So the key point is that DNS is a distributed database. It's a database when viewed in an abstract sense, it's a database mapping host names to IP addresses across the planet for every single host name, for every single computer that comes on, gets connected to the internet and has a host name. But the only way to do this for something like the internet is to distribute it. Because when a new computer gets assigned a name at the University of Calgary, it's not feasible that you wait until some central authority adds that to their database. Instead, the central authority just knows, I can trust this machine to give you answers about ucalgary.ca, and that machine is the one that needs to be updated when a new machine comes on at the university. The queries in this database is the host name and the type of record, like A or TXT, and the replies is the key again, the search query, and the value, known as the record, it's the answer to your query. And another key component in DNS is delegation. That is, when a name server doesn't have the answer to your question, it knows how to help you further. It knows how to find someone who might know the answer or knows how to find someone who knows how to find someone who might know the answer. So when we first want to look up cs.ucalgary.ca, we ask a root name server. They tell us, ask a .ca name server who tells us, go to the ucalgary.ca name server who then may be able to give us an answer. So this delegation is the key to how DNS can scale so that all of these machines can have their IP addresses and host names stored in this abstract distributed database. So let's look at a simple DNS query. Alice wants www.ucalgary.ca. The DNS goes to the ISP's name server. So Alice is at home. Let's say she uses TELUS. She goes to the name server provided by TELUS. Requests the address record. Now, TELUS knows that it's not authoritative. TELUS does not have the database of ucalgary.ca's servers. So something could have changed. It might have an answer that it, it saw last week, but... It could have changed in the interim. Machines are changing within organizations. New machines come on, come off. IP addresses can be shuffled around. So all it knows is that it's not responsible for managing all that information. It's not authoritative. Let's suppose further it doesn't have it in its cache. It might have had it at an earlier time, but then it expired, for example. So it, it, these, when you load it into a cache, they have an expiration time. It got kicked out. There's no information about it in the cache. So then this name server just goes out on the internet and tries to get an answer for Alice. The first thing it does is it goes to a root 
name server. And these have easy to remember host names. A dot root dash servers dot net, B dot root dash servers dot net, so on. And these are effectively hard coded. You can imagine these being equivalent to the certificate authorities that your browser has hard coded. Your browser knows the IP addresses of these root name servers. And that means that it can send a packet to them without having to figure out who to ask. Because as well, if you didn't know who to ask and you just got some information and connected this IP address if you want some information about your name servers, then you may very well ask Eve. At some point, you need a, a source of, uh, of trust in order to actually have any faith in the DNS system. And so we have hard-coded in these root servers. These, this represents the dot, the root of the tree. And you can see there's a variety of them. It's not just one single one. This is for resilience because, in effect, these servers are used in every single DNS query. Now, because of caching, as we'll see, they're not actually queried every single time you ever want to look up anything. So, for instance, if you didn't have ucalgary.ca in your cache, but you didn't have .ca in your cache, you wouldn't go to one of these root servers and say, tell me how to talk to .ca. You would just go straight to .ca. But if you really had nothing, if your cache was empty, if you cleared your cache and someone asked you to resolve a host name, you would first go to one of these root servers. And you can see they're managed by a couple companies, a couple authorities related to the internet, university, military. These are the root name servers. And a recursive name server, like the kind at your ISP that's going to look up an IP address for you, they're pre-configured with this list of all the root servers. It picks one at random and asks for the A record. It says, I'd like to know ucalgary.ca. But the root server doesn't know anything about ucalgary.ca, which it freely admits. Its job isn't to know the full tree. Its job is to know the children in that tree, this distributed database. So it knows... Well, if you want a .ca, anything .ca, talk to the .ca name server. If you want anything .com, talk to the .com name server. Anything .ch, talk to the .ch name server. So when you ask it about ucalgary.ca, it replies with a list of .ca name servers. The next step on the path, one level down on this tree. Now you can talk to this machine who may be able to help you further. It sends a list of name server records of servers more qualified to answer your question. These servers are called GTLDs or global top level domain servers. So the top level domain TLD, that's the .ca.com.org.net and the servers, the name servers responsible for managing them are called the global top-level domain servers. So you go to the root servers, they give you a list of GTLDs, and then you can go to the GTLD and ask again. In addition, it also provides A records for these servers as well. And these are called glue records. Glue because they're attached you didn't ask for them, but they come along for the ride. And the reason is because DNS is happening all the time. You want it to be efficient. You don't want to have extra round trip times of communication just to say, I would like to talk, I would like the host, the IP address for www.ucalgary.ca. And it says, well, I don't know how to help you there, but maybe you should go to nameserver.ucalgary.ca for more information. And then you say, all right. 
I would like to the IP address of nameserver.ucalgary.ca. And then it says, oh, well, that's the IP address. The idea of a glue record is that it anticipates that your very next question will be, all right, now that you've told me the host name to talk to next, what's its IP address? It gives it for you, so you don't have to look it up again. These glue records are important because there are security considerations as a result of them. The idea is, of course, to save time, convenience, in looking it up. The next step, the recursive name server goes to a random name server for .ca, one of the ones it just got from the root name servers, because the root name server noticed that it's looking for something .ca. And it says, what's the A record for www.ucalgary.ca? Again, whichever name server is responsible for the entirety of .ca is not going to be authoritative for a particular machine within the University of Calgary. It's not authoritative either. So it does the exact same process. It gives referrals to name servers as before. But this is likely going to be then UCalgary's authoritative name server. That is, the name server for the .c domain is likely to know the name server at the University of Calgary that's going to give you the answer. And, of course, UCalgary.ca could further have multiple name servers for zones within it, one for cs.ucalgary.ca and for other faculties as well, might have their own name servers, and so then there would be a further step in this process. But for something like google.com, you would go to the .com, then the google.com would then be the authoritative name server for the machine that you're after. So you get a list of ucalgary.ca name servers, the zone masters, and the replicas of it. And you pick, again, one at random. You visit it, and you say, what is www.ucalgary.ca? This time you get an A record. This time that name server is authoritative. And there's a bit in the return packet. And the bit is the authoritative flag, and it's set to 1 if it's an authoritative answer, it's set to 0 if it's not an authoritative answer. For instance, if you're getting a cached answer, you won't have this bit set. But if you're getting the answer straight from the source at the time, you're going to be told, by the way, this I'm responsible for knowing this information, and this is the correct information. Now... Of course, this is just a bit from some IP address, so it's not secure in the sense that you're absolutely certain of it. It's just as long as there, everyone's cooperating and everyone isn't, or er, everyone is following the protocol correctly, then you can know that this answer is correct. At this point, the recursive name server, which we recall, this is the ISP that actually went out on this six-packet dance to get an answer, then returns it back to the client. So, eight packets in total, client goes to the recursive name server, the ISP, the ISP goes to root, and it comes back, goes to .ca, comes back, go to ucalgary.ca, comes back, returns the answer to the client. Importantly, Crucially, for the internet to actually work, for this DNS system to actually scale at the at how it does so that everyone can use the internet, it keeps its answer in its cache. So it's not visiting one of these root name servers, these very few root name servers, every single time that anyone ever wants to look up a host name. Most of the time, certainly if it's a popular host name, it just has the answer and it can look it up. Otherwise, if it's a host name it hasn't seen before, but it's still within ucalgary.ca, it can go straight to the ucalgary.ca name server. It doesn't need to ask the .ca one. Occasionally, when, when these cache entries expire, when they've been around for too long, the .ca, for instance, will will be evicted and it'll go the, the name server will go back, the resolver will go back to one of the roots and say, what is the .ca, is it, and then it gets the answer. So if the .ca name server had to ever change its IP address, 
the expiration of these cash records will be sure to make it happen that they'll get updated eventually. It's not that these recursive resolvers will keep stale data around forever. Aside from the fact that these root name servers, they're chiseled in stone. They're fixed. These IP addresses are hard-coded in, and so they better not change. When you give a cached answer, it no longer keeps the authoritative leg. So that bit is set to zero. It's a non-authoritative answer. Again, this is an IP packet. There's no... There, the ability for an adversary to switch the bit from zero to one at edit, uh, whatever, checksums may be appropriate or necessary, that is easy for the attacker to do. So we can't trust that the authoritative flag represents a security feature of the DNS system. It's just there. What the recursive name server is saying is that I'm not the one who's supposed to know this information. This is just what I know. This is happening trillions of times daily. Maybe not the entire 8-packet dance, but every single time a hostname gets resolved to an IP address, this is a, a database lookup in this distributed database that is DNS. Google does billions of these DNS resolves daily. And... It's so fast that users don't perceive this latency. It takes longer to actually do a TLS handshake or download the website than the DNS. The DNS is not slowing down web browsing. The DNS is very fast. And partly it's because of this caching. The idea that we don't actually have to do the full 8-packet dance in order for it to work. DNS is distributed. There's no single machine that knows everything. How it works, the key to how it works is through this delegation. That one machine knows who to talk to to help the user along. And you can imagine as well there's a nice metaphor with routing on the internet. When you send your packet out, it's not that the first link that you send it to knows necessarily where it's where it's going to end up where it's supposed to go you just send it out and each machine along the way routes it closer and closer to the destination dns works similarly from right to left instead of left to right ip address reading left to right indicates where to route it to host names read right to left indicating which name server to talk to But crucially, there's no security with DNS at all. There's nothing that stops Eve from running a name server. These are just software. So anyone can just run a name server. They can claim to be authoritative. Eve could say she's a root name server or a .ca name server or a ucalgary.ca name server. Eve can claim whatever zone... Eve wants. Eve can set the authoritative bit on all of the DNS resolves. But the key is that no higher level name server will ever delegate to Eve. Anyone can just run a name server, but if no one ever says, hey, you want to talk to this machine in order to get an answer, if no one ever points to that machine, if no one ever refers to Eve's machine, delegates to Eve's machine, then Eve's machine will just never receive any requests and therefore never can issue any fake replies. But in principle, any machine could be running DNS. It's just a protocol on a particular port. So you can listen, you can answer packets. It's just a matter of, will anyone ever actually ask you any questions? So DNS is a UDP protocol. So, we have an IP header, source IP address, destination IP address, 
the UDP header, source port, destination port, the length of the packet and the checksum over the data, and then the actual DNS data. Importantly is the query ID. The way DNS works is that every query that is issued has a query ID that is used to identify the response. So one machine might want to look up www.ucalgary.ca and image.ucalgary.ca, for example, at the same time or very close to each other. And so when you send out two DNS queries in the same time, you don't just block until you get a response. You don't just sit there and wait and then send the next one. You might send out multiple requests at the same time, and this is why you use a query ID. So when you get the answer, you say, ah, this is the, the query ID in the answer is for ucalgary.ca or www.ucalgary.ca. So you can link the question of what is the IP address with the source name with the answer. You can have multiple pending DNS queries. So we have the source and destination IP addresses. These are, of course, possible to forge. They're just IP addresses. So there's no guarantee that they're correct. If you forged the source IP address, then you won't hear the response. But if you're trying to do a denial of service attack, using the fact that the reply to a DNS is larger than the request, maybe you forged the IP address of the source so that a victim machine is the one that receives the response, an unsolicited response. You can forge the destination IP address, but if it's not a DNS server, it's not going to be very useful to you. And of course, you have the source and destination ports. Servers listen on 53, the UDP port 53, that's the standard, that's the protocol. So 53 is for UDP, or on UDP is for DNS, same way that 80 is for HTTP and 443 is for TLS. We have UDP 53 for DNS. The source port, however, the one coming from the requester, the, the querier, this can vary. Sometimes it's also just 53, so it just the operating system just uses 53 for both queries and responses. Sometimes the operating system just has a fixed random port. It just Imagine at install time, it just picks a random number, and that's the number it uses for every DNS query. Or it just picks a random port every single time. So you make a DNS query, you get a random port. The port doesn't matter as long as you listen on the same port to get the answer. What matters is the 53 for the destination, because, I mean, you could run a DNS server on a different non-standard port, but you would have to know that when you're issuing your request because the standard is 53. In the same way, if you connect to HTTP server, it's going to connect on port 80. And you have to go out of your way to specify a different port if you're not actually listening on port 80. The query ID is the unique identifier created in every query packet. And this is left intact by the server. So the server receives a query, there's a query ID, the server replies with the same query ID so the client knows which query the server is answering. And the name server may have many queries at one particular time from many different machines. But as long as the query ID and the port and IP address are all unique, there will be no confusion. So the IP address and port, that represents the client who's actually making these requests. And if multiple requests are happening at the same time, the query ID further discriminates among the answers. And there's a bit QR. This is set to zero if it's a query, one for a response. So just looking at the packet, after the query ID, is 
a single bit QR. This just means query or response. There's some more bits. AA means authoritative answer. This is the I'm the authority bit that I had mentioned before. So if AA is set to true, then it's a, a, an authoritative bit. TC means truncated. This is basically saying, because it's a UDP protocol, the answer can't fit in the maximum packet size. Basically, try again with TCP. That is, for instance, let's say you ask for the text records, and there's lots of text records associated with the, this particular host name. You cannot get the answer through UDP. The internet is too unreliable. Packets get reordered. You don't have a, a notion of streams of data. If you can't fit the entire answer in a single packet, then you try again with TCP. And TC means here's the first part of the answer, but you're missing a bunch. RD is recursion desired. This is a client request to the server saying, hey, I mean, if you don't have the answer, could you do all the work to look it up for me? Thanks. There's no need for this to be honored, of course, and the server can reply saying recursion is not available. RA, recursion available, zero means you can ask for me to do all the work, but I, I'm not equipped to do that or I won't do that. You're going to have to get somebody else. The zero bit, Z, as you see here, or rather the zero, the, the bits associated with the zero field, these are reserved. The reason we do things like this in protocol design is sometimes in the future, maybe we want to still use DNS, still have the same DNS packets, but want to have additional functionality. And so old machines can will just ignore the zero part because they're running an older version of DNS, in which case they simply will fail to handle the request correctly. But newer machines can look at it and say, ah, this, zero, this normally used to be zero, but now it means, now I see a four, it means some specific behavior, and then it does that new behavior instead. So machines that aren't updated so that they don't know how to handle non-zero requests here will fail. More up-to-date versions will be able to handle these more elaborate requests. And it's not necessarily that we are going to necessarily use this, but rather just having this as an option allows for backwards compatibility later on, where we can issue requests that get ignored by machines that aren't equipped to handle it if we want to change the protocol, but it, one, uh, we can update some machines gradually and eventually update all the machines, and now the protocol has new meaning. R code means success or failure. Then there's the number of questions, so going back to the packet, the number of questions, the number of answers, the number of authority records, the number of additional records, these so-called glue records, and then finally the actual questions themselves and the questions and the answers. So that's the structure of a DNS packet, of a DNS request and response. So let's look at an example DNS transmission. This is taken from an de online description of the Kaminsky attack, which we'll talk about later in this lecture. We have a source IP and a destination IP in the IP part coming from a DNS resolver going to a GTLD server. Now, this isn't officially the first step of the DNS protocol. Officially, you would go to the root servers, but if you have cached records from the root servers, you would bypass that step. And it's reasonable to assume that at any particular point in time, a DNS resolver will know who to talk to for .com, .net, .org, .ca, and so forth. Then, the destination port is port 53, meaning that it's going to a, a DNS servers. There's a, a source port which looks arbitrary. There's a query ID, 43561. Query response is set to zero. And in particular, there's a question. So question count equals one with the question, what is the A record for www.unixwiz.net? Now, 
in practice, it wouldn't be written out in English. It would be written in a machine language. But effectively, that's what the question is saying. Give me the A record for this domain. The reply would then come back from the GTLD server. So you see the IPs are swapped, the ports are swapped, the query ID remains the same. It's now a response. AA is set to zero, meaning it's not an authoritative response. But the question is repeated, question count one, what is the A record? And now there is an indication of who is the authority for that piece of information. So there's an authority count of two, meaning there's two authority records unixwiz.net's name server can be found at linux.unixwiz.net or it can be found at cs.unixwiz.net and these are valid for two days so it comes with the time to live. Additionally, there are two AD records, additional records. These are glue records that we talked about. Again, they have a different time to live of one hour and they're saying that the IP address, the A record for this is you know, these two IPs that are listed. And notice the difference between the time to live. Host names are going to change less frequently than IP addresses. It's quite possible that linux.unixwiz.net can, and another machine steps into its place and no one really notices, except people whose DNS records are stuck around for too long and they can't handle the fact that this might change. Whereas the host name, linux.unixwiz.net, being the actual DNS authority for the zone, is likely to not change as frequently. So they can say two days for this piece of information, one hour for this piece of information. The next step is to then go to the zone master. So again, the DNS resolver goes to the zone master and says, hello, what is the A record for this domain? Again, it's a query, same query ID. Response comes back saying that this is now an authoritative answer. I know this information firsthand and I'm telling it to you in this packet. We have the question getting repeated. We have the answer. Answer count is now one. There is an answer to this question. The A record is this particular IP address. Again, this is valid for one hour and the other information available as well. Now in practice, the full effort of this eight or this uh, eight packet dance that we talked about where first the client goes to the ISP and the ISP goes to the root, then to the GTLD, then to the zone master, and all of that gets a response and then finally gives the answer back. This is not needed because of the use of caching. And when you have an authoritative answer, you can cache that and you can give it out to people later. If someone asks you, hey, can you tell me the IP address for this host name? If you know what the answer is because you just, within a time to live, received that information from that, for instance, the zone master itself, you can just say, well, I'm not an authority, authority set, bit set to zero, but here's the information that I know. And you can include whatever glue records you want to use afterwards. But we don't want to cache DNS forever, right? This will lead to stale data that renders it ineffective. If people have DNS records from years ago, these machines may not even exist anymore. IP addresses do change and they should change. New machines do come online and get replaced. So the idea of DNS is we don't have the single fixed mapping of host names to IP addresses that everyone can just download once and be done with. But rather, it's evolving, it's changing, and we're trying to discover the correct information at a particular moment in time so that we can effectively use the internet. This is why there is this time to live, this TTL. This is how long data can be considered valid in a cache setting so that it can just be stored and given out to other people who are asking for it well, as necessary. And the TTL is set by the administrator of the zone. So you're permitted to set whatever TTL you think is reasonable. If you happen to run an organization that changes IP addresses monthly or less, then you might give a TTL that reflects that. Whereas if you know machines are constantly coming up and down and being randomly assigned and dynamically uh, 
allocated, then you might have a much shorter TTL for the information you give out. It's up to you to decide what's appropriate. And this is important because it means that the recursive name server doesn't need to guess this information on your behalf. It can just have access to the information. And when a record expires, it gets removed from the cache. As well, it's not just the A records that are cached, but any of the information that is relevant. So NS records plus the glued A records, they're cached and they have different TTLs as we saw.